हेलो फ्रेंड्स टुडे वी आर डिस्कशन वी आर डूइंग अ ग्रुप डिस्कशन अबाउट पैथोलॉजीज इन शोल्डर एंड द शोल्डर प्रोसीजर्स और शोल्डर सर्जरीज दैट वी रूटीनली डू सो विद मी आर डॉक्टर आकाश डॉक्टर शशांक एंड डॉक्टर अनिल एंड दे विल बी डिस्कसिंग अबाउट वेरियस शोल्डर पैथोलॉजी सो लेट स्टार्ट द ग्रुप डिस्कशन एंड वी विल बी कवरिंग वेरियस काइंड ऑफ शोल्डर पैथोलॉजीज सर हाउ मच Okay, this my specific case if a patient presents to us in a OPD with a clinical symptoms, but we get an MRI done and we see only a partial tear, approximately less than three mm of tear. So, what? How would you like to approach? We should go for a scopy or we should manage a conservative. So, a partial tear is one subgroup of patient in which we are very much reluctant to do a surgical procedure. So, we need to see and evaluate the MRI as well as see the clinical picture. so many a times these uh, partial rotator cuff tear patients they will be stiff as well mm -hmm. so most of the times the treatment will be physiotherapy and rehabilitation now coming to the partial rotator cuff tear there are three uh, spectrum you can have a partial articular sided you can have a uh, partial laminar and partial bursal okay. partial interstitial or partial bursal so usually we would like to operate only those patients who are more than 50% one and that too if they are on the bursal side then we are more aggressive in doing the arthroscopic procedure so by and large less than so because the uh, footprint of the rotator cuff is around 2 cm so if less than 1 cm is then we are any be going to be on conservative side but if it is more than a cm of the footprint which is exposed then you may consider a surgical intervention and that too after a failed conservative management more indicated arthroscopy is more indicated for a bursal than for an articular and specifically indicated if the patient has a got a good range of motion and still he has pain so partial bursal side tear will be more commonly seen with impingement phenomenon external impingement with a bony spur whereas the partial articular or the partial pasta lesion will be more commonly seen with a internal impingement an internal impingement is usually seen in throwers along with the contracture so they will have a posterior capsular contracture that is called as a picc that is posterior inferior capsular contracture and these patients will have internal impingement these patients have to be treated non operatively with internal rotation stretching programs so we'll ask the patient to do internal rotation stretching exercise more and more so as to reduce the internal impingement and only if it is not success successful after 3 to 6 months of rigorous physiotherapy only then you will intervene and arthroscopic procedures for that uh second question sir my uh, like same uh, old age patient comes to our opd uh, with a complaint uh, and we have diagnosed it as a rotator cuff tear so uh, when we should how we should counsel the patient regarding that uh, uh, the if uh, the rotator cuff is very massive and it is not repairable so uh, how should we counsel the patient uh -huh. so uh, the most important thing is uh, we should do a clinical examination mri the thing we forget is x-ray so always get an x-ray of these patients and if the acromioneural distance is reduced then it is an indirect indicator of a large or a massive tear yes. so if the distance is less than 6 mm it is an indication that the cuff will be massive and i would not recommend a repair of the patient if the humeral head is touching the acromion so if it is touching then it is a sign of a Uh, rotator cuff arthropathy which is sudden mm -hmm. and those patients would probably need a reverse shoulder replacement but then you should have a very good view occasionally the view is in is oblique or some angle too so you should have a good standing ap view and on that if the humeral head is touching the acromion you should not attempt a repair if it is if there is a gap of about 5 to 6 mm you can still do a repair and in these cases you have to be prepared for all the uh, techniques of the massive cuff repairs now per se age is not a criteria even if you can do uh, good repairs in a higher age group also and the other thing is chronicity also so if it is a fresh tear it will be easier to repair if it is a chronic long standing tear it may be difficult to repair in some cases uh but the what should we uh, uh, how should we counsel the patient regarding this ke uh, uh, do we go into the repair arthroscopic repair or we just counsel regarding that it is not repairable we have to so if the you should you see the mri Yes, so x-ray picture if you have some space yes, and on mri you feel that there is some tendon which is left and which you can repair so you can come, you can ask the patient that we will be taking for scopy and we will be trying to repair it 
will be using the techniques of reflexive prototype of repair like medialization, like interval slides, like releases, capsular releases. Occasionally we can do a muscle slide procedure also. But everything we will do to repair it. Now as Burkhardt says that even if you are able to do partial cuff repairs in these scenarios, these patients will do well. And the important thing is the force couple. Now what is force couple? Is you need to balance the forces. So if the rotator cuff is torn from posterior aspect or anterior aspect, so it becomes, it makes the shoulder unstable. Yes. So even if you are able to repair some scap part and anterior part of the supra, or if you are, if there is a posterior tear, you are able to repair the posterior infra. So they will make the shoulder balanced. And a balanced shoulder will last for long. A imbalanced shoulder, so this, if the shoulder is, is having an anterior superior cuff tear or a posterior superior cuff tear, they will do bad. But if you are able to balance the forces, the force couple, if you are able to balance it, they will have a longevity which is more. So even if you are able to repair part of the cup, it is good and it is worthwhile to do a repair. So is there any uh, role of acromioplasty while we are doing cup repair? Yes, so uh, actually uh, acromioplasty is indicated if you have a type 3 acromion, type C acromion. And typically it may be needed without a rotator cuff in those patients who have a large impingement. Yes. So normally what we do is we do the repairs and if after the repair we feel that the acromion is tight and we are not able to move our instruments easily after the repair, then we usually we take out a part of that acromion. So the amount of the acromion which is excised has now decreased over time. So previously people used to go very aggressive yes. acromioplasty. Now we are doing a little bit less of acromioplasty. But still after repair, if you feel that it is tight and it is impinging on the cuff, it is always better to remove that part of the acromion. Occasionally you may need to remove a part of the distal clavicle also if there is a spur on that portion. So uh, acromion and distal clavicle spurs you can remove if it is impinging on the cuff. Uh, sir, how uh, we decide the space is uh, narrow? In arthroscopy? In, in, uh, yes, by arthroscopy. So arthroscopy you do a repair yes, sir. and after that your shaver is around 4 mm. Yes. And the RF probe is also around 4 mm. So that should pass out easily. If you, it is tight, it is not able to pass, then better to release it. About 6 mm of space is what is recommended. You should. Uh, on, and sir, so, uh, regarding subacromial decompression, should we do it like uh, on a, as a, on a regular basis in older patients, in older age groups? So if, if you have an impinging acromion, you can do it. But as I told you, the amount of bone that we dissect is reducing over time. So previously you should be very aggressive acromioplasties. Now we are not that aggressive on removal of the things. Sir, how do you go about the biceps region? Like to do tenotomy or tenotesis along with. So it's more of like a clinical examination in the patient or depending upon the type of the region? More on, more on the scopy actually. Okay. Clinical examination is one. Uh, if you have a biceps lesion which is evident on the arthroscopy findings, which may include a, a fraying, which may include uh, split in the biceps tendon. Ideally, you should address it. Usually, more than 60 years of age, we would try to do a tenotomy. Less than that, in a heavy worker, you can consider a tenotesis. The third procedure that we are doing nowadays is a biceps SCR. So, we are utilizing the biceps, lateralizing it. But for doing a biceps SCR, you need have to have a bicep that is relatively normal. So, it should not have a tears, it should not, should not have a big splits, it should not have a large lesions. Per se. Sir, how do you, what are your tips and tricks if as the bone here, like if the tear is large and massive and the bone here is more osteoporotic, yes. along with have some kind of calcinosis, calcinosis deposition along with. So what is the something that we need to take care when we go for a fixation? So it is a very important question because Indian patients you will have a very high incidence of osteoporosis yes. and you can have tendon pull-outs. Yes. So what we do here, you must have seen is we are starting normally with a 4.75 mm. Most, most of the cases we are using a 4.7 okay. anchor, peak anchor. If you are not able to get a good hold, you can increase it to 5.5 and then you can increase it to 6.5. Similarly, for the LR anchor also, you should have a backup of 6.5 anchor. So mostly we are using LR anchor 5.5, but if you need, you may need to have a 6.5 backup. So using a larger anchor is one technique. Uh, using a buddy anchor is another thing. If you put an anchor and if you feel that the anchor is not strong enough, in the same hole you can put one more anchor. So that is what is a buddy anchor technique. So you, that is a second technique. And the third technique which is described, which is not very commonly used, is cementing of the anchor. So you can use a bone cement 
and you can put it. There's a technique which is that you put it through a tube, and uh, over the anchor you put the cement. In, so that cement heals up into, into the anchor. But the negative part is that it prevents the biology. So it burns out the nearby area and it reduces the biology. But that is the last resort that I will go into. Cementing the anchor into the bone. That is the last technique that we have for a osteoporosis. Uh, sir, is there any uh, difference like if uh, depend on the type of the tear, the por uh, portals we use for, for seeing that? Yes. So uh, we start with the posterior portal and most of the anterior and the subscap work and the anterior part of the subscap you can address with that. But if you have a posterior superior tear like you have an infra tear or a tennis spinal tear, it is better to make it uh, a more posterolateral or a lateral portal so that you can go on the back side. So more posterior anchors if you have anterior tear and more anterior portals if you have posterior portals, lateral or anterior portals. Uh, so one more question regarding uh, how do we sir, uh, what is the, uh, the disadvantage for o, uh, o using the fluid which causes the extravasation in the deltoid muscle on the So by, by and large you, I am not a very big fan of using a pump in the shoulder. So we usually do our scopies without pump and that keeps our pressure low and prevents the extravasation that is number one. The other thing is you should try to keep uh, one track. So like if you are doing multiple tracks or you are when they are subcutaneously you are pumping multiple tracks then it is a more chance of doing a uh, extra rotation. So and the third thing is you can use cannulas. So different type of cannulas if you are using so that also prevents extra rotation. Uh, cannula mother, uh, through that uh, portal throughout the procedure. Huh. So occasionally we do it without the cannula. Yes, and the benefit of that is that is the Bernoulli's theorem that if the, the water is coming out, so there is no uh, uh, this effect of the what we say is um, there is no uh, there is a smooth flow and that in increases the vision. So you can do uh, all everything without a cannula, but if you put the cannula, you will be uh, like a reducing the flow and containing the. So you you can do it both the ways. So for the rotator cuff repairs, how do you decide if you want to go for a single row repair or a double row repair? So if you see um, biologically, the double row repairs do well. But the negative thing of, uh, of double row repair, there is one side effect or one complication and that is called as a musculotendinous tear. Okay. So what happens is when you do a double row repair, you tie on the middle pair and then you pull it and you tie on the other side. Yes. So what it causes, it causes the avascularity at the musculotendinous junction and you may have tears on that. So if you have a very, very massive tear and if you are pulling it with too much tension, that may cause a musculotendinous tear. So don't repair under tension. So whatever repair you do, it should be a tension-free repair and you can utilize it to reduce the tension. So I would do double row repair in most of the cases, apart from very small tears in which a little part of the footprint is exposed, so one single anchor, single row is fine. And a very very massive tear, that it is not possible to do a full footprint repair. Mm. So there you can just do a single row repair and at less tension that's okay. So otherwise most of the routine cases, it is recommended to have a double row for a area healing. So single row basically is a point healing and double row is two anchors so it is an area healing. So the biological healing is better in a double row technique. How much can you medialize that? Um, Approximately you can medialize up to a centimeter, up to a centimeter. Is there any landmark like we, we can see there and... Uh... But you can just, because you need to erode the cartilage. Yes. So you can cart remove the cartilage about a 1 cm to middleize the insertion of the rotator cuff to reduce the tension. Sir, so in bony van carts, why a distal bone block procedure is better than a lethargic one and that more arthroscopic? So basically a lethargic procedure is an open procedure number one. The accuracy that you put the screws would be little less in an open procedure. The fixation wise, we, when we do a bone block procedure, we fix it up with bilateral buttons or an insert clutch. And the soft tissue repair after a bone block is better as compared to that the soft tissue procedure that we are able to do after a lethargy. So if you see a classical lethargy, the Walsh procedure of lethargy, lethargy has three components. It is a bone block, it is a sling and it is a capsular repair. So the capsular repair after the lethargy is usually not a very good uh, repair and uh, overhang of the bone block can happen 
if it is not covered with the capsule. So with uh, arthroscopic bone block, we are more accurate regarding placement of the bone block, that is number one. And the soft tissue repair is better than the lethargy. So these are the two advantages. The bone block is uh, lagging behind the lethargy as far as the sling effect is concerned. But it has, if you put a good bone block and put a soft tissue repair, it usually works. And the chances of late arthritis, post-traumatic arthritis is less with a bone block procedure as compared to a post lethargic patient. Sir, so does this also depend upon the act physically how the active the patient is? If the patient is a thrower, athlete kind of thing, then usually again, we go with more of a bone block procedure rather than a lethargic? Usually a, a bone block procedure will suffice for an athlete and a, should not should not be a problem. Because you are you are providing a, a substitute for the bone loss and you are doing a very thorough repair of the lying card and you may have time to it. So overall you can do a very good solid repair and it, it's a good procedure if you want to do it for an athlete also. Uh, sir, one more uh, back to the bone block procedure. Uh, sir, uh, like uh, in supracapsular release we do. Uh, sir, uh, what are the indications per se ke, uh, when we see the MRI and uh, we will uh, we'll, uh, keep in mind that we have to do a supracapsular reconstruction? So superior capsular reconstruction, there are two techniques. When you can use a biceps, native bicep, which is the best, or you can use a graft of the tensor patient. The important parameters are reduction of the space, less patient age, because if the patient is less, we are not thinking in direction of reverse. So if the patient's age is less, like if the patient is less than 50, 55 years of age, if he has a uh, humeral head which is abutting the uh, acromion, and which have a very bad petty atrophy on the MRI images. So these patients are very uh, classical patients in which you put a graft and then you can do a uh, like a side to side repair, anterior and posterior repair to make in the force. So subscap repair, infra repair and for the supra you put a superior capsular reconstruction. So for that you can put a PMN. Sir, so one more regarding uh, rotator cuff repair. How do we manage the suture, the number of sutures? How do we manage? So, the... ideally what I recommend is that it is obviously the suture management is an art. But if you have more number of portals and if you are using different, different uh, uh, insertional devices, like if you are using your posterior portals, high posterior portals, nebiasir portals, modified nebiasir portals, then it will be easier. If you are doing everything through a single portal, then there is a more chances of entanglement of the sutures. So try to use more sutures and try to spread out the sutures so that will make your work easy. And the other trick occasionally I use is I use two company anchors. So if you are using two different company anchors, their color will be different. Yes. And that way you are less likely to get confused in the initial. So you can have two different company anchors. Every company has a different suture. So then it will become easier for you to identify and you will not be confused. Sir, in soap, uh, uh, per se, uh, rotator cuff and when it comes to Bengard, does the portal entry and everything for placement, it changes and how? Yes. So for the uh, for the Bengard, you need a portal which is parallel to the glenoid. So suppose that if you make one portal, you make the anterior two portals and you see from the anterior portal afterwards. And if you feel from the, from the superior anterior superior portal, you put a scope. Yeah. And if you feel that your posterior portal is not parallel to the glenoid, it is better you make another portal because your rest of the surgery will be easier. So for Bankart, your posterior portal should be parallel to the glenoid. So when you put your passenger rod or your instruments, yes. it should pass parallel to the glenoid. And glenoid is usually antiverted little bit. So uh, that way you have to be, uh, uh, your, actually it's not antiverted, but your patient is antiverted when you are in the lateral position. So normally you will have this, something like this. Uh, sir, uh, uh, for rotator cuff re uh, repair, with or without superior capsular reconstruction, does it uh, have any effect on the physiotherapy rehabilitation? So, physiotherapy depending on, is actually my practice will depend on the post procedure satisfaction that I have. So, if I am satisfied by, with my repair in the end of the surgery, I can start a relatively faster year. In those patients in which I have done a massive repair, I have done a lot of releases, I may ask my physiotherapist to go a little slow on the rehab and also if the bone quality is poor I would ask my physiotherapist to go on a slower rehab. So otherwise if your bone fixation is good you are happy with your repair you can start a rapid rehab within 2 to 3 weeks.
otherwise about a month or in a very bad cases you can take one and a half months as well. So usually shoulder repair, arthroscopy, or the cuff or back. Our patient have high complaint of pain and stiffness post surgery. Uh, so so but how to uh, back our patient will not complain pain of pain. pain. So the painful patients will be typically rotator cuff patients, and because it is because the rotator cuff typically in the subacromial area has got a lot of blood vessels. So it's it's an area in which there is a lot of inflammation. So usually you need to tackle them patients with a lot of patience. Ask them. Uh, you can give them uh, analgesics, rehab. Occasionally, if the patients are getting stiff, then also the pain is more. So you can aggressively increase the rehab of those patients. If the patient is getting stiffer, you can increase the rehab of the patients, and you may increase the need of uh, the painkillers for the time. Uh, sir, uh, what is the the basic rehabilitation protocol means you follow? So it depending on the tear. So for a bank card, it is fixed. You have to have a one month of arm pouch, and then you can start the rehabilitation movements, etc. For cuff tears, depending on the size of tear, partial cuff tears one to two weeks, regular cuff tears around three weeks, and massive cuff tears you may need four to six weeks of immobilization followed by rehabilitation. So what are your indications for doing a replacement surgery in shoulder? So for a rotator cuff. As I told you, if the patient is starting having rotator cuff arthropathy, that means the humeral head is abutting the acromion on an epi X-ray, standing X-ray. Then it is one indication, and rest of the indications are very simple. Like if you have a post-traumatic arthritis, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, bad cases like if you have a neglected posterior dislocation for years, these kind of patients you can consider for a shoulder replacement. Tumors you can consider for. Complex proximal humerus fractures along with that. So complex proximal humerus, I would still uh, recommend a fixation, fillos. But my uh, absolute indications to do a uh, replacement are head split fractures, non-reconstructable, non-platable fractures, uh, four-part severe osteoporosis, and very elderly patients with severe osteoporosis. These are the indications in which you can do actually a primary reverse for a good reason. Sir, uh, uh, regarding what are your tricks in doing a reverse shoulder? Do you go by classic deltopectoral approach or? Uh, so you can use a deltopectoral approach or you can use a deltoid split approach. But I go in between the deltopectoral and deltoid split because we don't want to be very medial. We want to be a little lateral. So I would preferably to go into an interval which is just lateral to the cephalic plane. And sir, how much do we need to medialize and distalize it? To uh, so uh, for if you see the reverse shoulder. <coughs> The classic Gramo processes, the initial designs, they were the designs of medialization. So you you tend to medialize the humerus and you tend to medialize the humerus. And these are the designs in which you distalize the shoulder but you don't lateralize it. So initial processes were coming up with an angle, the neck shaft angle, angle of 155 degrees. So nowadays the processes we are doing, which is we are doing. Uh, Most of the Zimmer Biomet processes, so it's a it's a only processes, and the neck shaft angle is about 135. And these processes will lateralize as well as distalize, but it will distalize less as compared to the Gramo design. So you have a less chances of uh, acromial fractures, acromial stress response, and notching. So notching and acromial fractures are more common with medialized designs, medialized Zimmer design, as compared to a Lateralized humor, the humerus design that is more commonly used nowadays. So nowadays, what we are using is either medialized genoid and lateralized humerus, or a lateralized humerus and a lateralized genoid. Yeah. Normally, that is more recommended nowadays. So how do we prevent scapular notching in so, reverse shoulder? Uh, so again, uh, notching is not a complication. So uh, some amount of notching is acceptable. So only the grade four notching is pathologic when it evades through the inferior screw. Yes. It goes through the inferior screw that is pathological. Otherwise, it is acceptable. And as I told you, using a more lateralized humeral design is usually safe. Uh, besides that, we tend to inferiorize the glenoid base plate, and we need to inferiorize the. So you use an offset on the glenosphere, and tend to use a more uh, uh, put it on a more inferior aspect. So inferior offset, increasing inferior offset is a technique. 
to increase the decrease the uh, notching mm -hmm. leg notching. Sir, uh, as the patient for the reverse shoulder, mostly osteoporotic, they will come to us at the age of very late age only. So, do you go with the cemented or uncemented? So, Sir, if you are using, using a regular, if you are doing a reverse shoulder for arthropathy, osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, most of the cases you will be able to put a proximally coated uncemented prosthesis. <laughs> the patients in which the proximal portion is worn off like a fracture case there is no proximal bone to fit the proximal humerus so those patients will need to be cemented so trauma patients and tumor patients in which you have to do a resection of the proximal humerus so these are the two patients in which you do cementing primarily very very rarely you need to do a cementing in the other group but in most of the groups you can do a uncemented option easily because it's a proximal fit and it's a non weight bearing joint so usually the proximal fit is good and you will be able to do it. Now there are two designs. The one we have you have seen is basically an onlay design. The other design with the striker one is a tonier is an inlay design. Mm -hmm. So you can actually uh, read the metaphysis and put the it into this. So that's an inlay design. Sir, any uh, experience about stemless and stemmed to anatomical total shoulder? Uh, so uh, stemless reverse India it is not available. Mm -hmm. Stemless uh, hemi and stemless total are available but uh, I have not seen very encouraging results with them. So I am not a proponent of a stemless hemi or a stemless uh, total person. They, they, don't, they are not that pain free and the range of motion is not good. The range of motion that we, that we reverse is not. So previously we used to do a lot of anatomical total shoulders. Yes. But again the range and the function after an anatomical shoulder is much lesser as compared to reverse. So nowadays we are more inclined in doing reverse in most of the arthritic cases as well as uh, trauma cases. So in trauma also instead of doing a regular hemi we are inclined in doing a primary reverse as compared to a primary hemi. So in your personal risk, uh, experience inlay or onlay which is a better for reverse? Uh, yes for reverse or maybe numerous, so for numerous. Uh, so yes. humerus actually depends on the technique that you do. So when you do uh, inlay processes, you decreases, decrease the tension. Mm -hmm. So there is lesser chances of uh, any um, uh, neuroprexias and lesser chances of acromial stress response. Uh, if you do an onlay, it will give you a better uh, stability. Mm -hmm. So there are pros and cons of both of things. Uh, if you ask my personal opinion, I am more of an onlay guy. But then if you are using inlay, then you can just follow the principle of inlay and do it. So uh, inlay is more lax, I would say, onlay is more tight. So with onlay, you have more neuroprexias, more stability. Here you have less neuroprexias, less stability. Sir, in some cases where the glenoid is too small for a base plate to be put on, how do we... So, so you, you need to have a mini base plate, the 25 mm is the smallest base plate that is available and usually that will uh, in, uh, suffice. The only thing you will not be able to do in those cases is you will not be able to put the AP screws. No. Usually you will be able to put superior inferior screws, inferior. but AP and lateral screws you may not have a good purchase if the glenoid is very small, that is okay. So even if you are doing that uh, tawny design, so it is recommended if you are not putting AP screws, that is okay, you can just put superior, superior inferior screws. Inferior. Yes. So regarding pseudo paralysis, uh, what is the better for these patients? Like uh, we should go for a arthroscopic repair in rotator, uh, rotator cuff. So pseudo paralysis is basically rotator cuff tear. Uh -huh. So I would recommend if the cuff is repairable, repair it for sure. Repair is much better, and plating is much better. Basic concepts. So reverse is only those patients you are not able to repair and you are not able to fix. fix. Otherwise, you are you are not going for a reverse. Reverse is a salvage surgery. It's not a primary surgery. If you are able to do repair, if you are, if you are able to fix the fraction, I think that's it. Sir, so other than the cost availability, cost effectiveness, the uh, bovine collagen that is available, other than use it, what are the indications that you prefer to use? So, uh, uh, Regentem basically is a, uh, is a bovine collagen patch which you can do, you can put over the rotator cuff to repair the rotator, uh, to increase the healing. So, it increases the healing, it increases the thickness, final thickness construct of the rotator cuff repairs. 
So those patients in which you feel that the repair is suboptimal, that is one case. And it is also recommended in those patients in you have a partial rotator cuff tears. You can just do not do a repair and just put it put the patch as it is. So it will increase the healing and thin out rotator cuff tears. Another indication which you have a very thin rotator cuff tear, and then you can increase it because it is postulated that if you put a patch, then it will increase the thickness of the rotator cuff by three millimeters, and it incorporates with the tendon. Sir, uh, in your techniques, we uh, once we are uh, we have shown that we can put a balloon inside the uh, acromion. So balloon is again a salvage procedure. It's not a primary procedure. So uh, it is going to be launched in India. It is so far not launched, but it is basically indicated for those patients who have an irreparable rotator cuff and the patient is not willing for do, going into an arthroplasty. Apart from those, I would do a repairs most of the time. Sir, in uh, glenohumeral arthritis type B2, where there is a biconcave glenoid and a posterior, posteriorly decentered head, how do we prepare the glenoid, sir? So, uh, basically, uh, nowadays, you have a augment option available Yes. in most of the systems. So, even if you are using a striker, you can use a biomed simmer, they have an augment system available. So, you can do two things. Ideally, it is recommended that you put your base plate at 0 degree of version. Yes. So, other thing is you can cheat a little bit. So, occasionally if I feel a little bit of posterior wear, I would little bit cheat uh, my placement and up to 10 degrees I would accept it. So, up to 10 degrees I, if I am putting my plate, I am okay. This is again debatable as far as the literature is concerned. They will say that you put always in a 0 degree of version. But in my personal practice, I would cheat up to 10 degrees. So, up to 10 degrees if you want to do a retroversion and put it, it is okay. Yes. If it is more than that, then it is better to use an augmented glenoid. And augmented glenoid again is of two types, a uh, half augment or a full augment. And it is recommended to use a half augment, it is better than using a full augment. So, the half augment in which, so you have a system in which you can use half augments. So, again that is also 5 and 10. So, you can use those augments for a type B2 glenoid for this posterior. The, again, the downside to this in India is the cost because the augmented glenoid again becomes a little bit more expensive. Sir, so, in distalizing in reverse shoulders, sir, how do we assess this is an adequate distalization so that it doesn't cause neuropathy? So, tension, tension. So, there are two things, two techniques that you can see. Once, once you are done with your preparation and once you are doing with them with the implantation. I am talking about the biomet processes. So the inferior edge of your uh, stem or the basically the uh, brooch should be at the level of the glenoid. Okay. The inferior edge of the brooch head, uh, your, is, should be at the level of the inferior level of the glenoid. So that is one. Second thing is you can assess the tension of the conjoint tendon first. So once you put your trial, you can assess the tension. It should not be very tight. Oh. Otherwise, it, it, will, it will place more stress on the nerves and it will have a, a high chance of acromial fracture. So it should not be very tight. But overall, by and large, I would still like to put the processes in a tight as compared to loose because the most common immediate complication of reverse shoulder is a Dislocation. So it should never be loose. It should be on a firmer tight, tighter thing. It should not be loose for sure. 